Right now we're in the midst of a war on obesity. You can't pick up the paper today without hearing some fear mongering that we're getting bigger and bigger and that it's causing more and more health problems and that it's becoming more and more of a cultural imperative that everybody lose weight and then they'll get healthier and it'll help the economy in so many ways. What we see is that this war on obesity is causing much more damage than it's helping people. Let me give you some examples. If you look at my body and if you were to um, weigh me or to measure my body mass index or my body fat percentage, everything would show up that I'm in the normal range. And from a medical standpoint, we're told that I'm supposed to be healthy because we always look at weight and those kinds of determinants as the main ways of conceptualizing health. What we see is that this really gives us a very misinformed idea of whether or not people are healthy. Um, and you may also, based on my weight, have some assumptions about what my eating habits are or what my exercise habits are. And again, when we actually look at the evidence, what we find is that all of the assumptions people have tend to be wrong. Um, for example, today it's certainly true. I do have um, very healthy, nutritious eating habits and perform a lot of good self-care activity, like I'm, I'm quite active and athletic. Um, and um, I'm also quite healthy metabolically. But that hasn't always been true. There have been times that at this exact weight, I've had an eating disorder. There's been times that I've been sedentary. And there have been times where I've had problems that we tend to blame on weight, things like severe joint pain in my knees. Um, so you would have misdiagnosed me at times just by virtue of making assumptions based on my weight. On the other hand, let's say my BMI was 10 points higher than it is right now and put me in the obese range. Then you might assume that I have either have problems with eating or that I'm um, lazy and don't get much exercise or that I'm unhealthy. And what we see scientifically is that there are a lot of people that are in the overweight and obese categories that actually have wonderful health habits and lead long, disease-free lives. So you'd be misdiagnosing them. In fact, we have some evidence to support this. The chart was based on a study that looked at a large population of people and there, where we had data about their cardiometabolic profile. And what we found is that in the normal weight category, there were a lot of people, in fact, 23.5% of the people in the normal weight category had an abnormal cardiometabolic profile. So if you assume they were healthy just by virtue of your, their weight, you would have been wrong. Likewise, you can see if you look in the column of normal cardiometabolic profile, and if you look in the overweight and obese rows, what you'll see is that there's a large portion of people there that are really quite healthy and are getting misdiagnosed. This is another way of showing that same information. If you look at the red lines, the red rectangles, what you'll see is that these are all of the people that we miscategorize when we use BMI as a proxy for cardiometabolic health. Or yet another way of framing it is that 51% of the people that are actually healthy we tell them they're unhealthy and that they need to lose weight and make changes. So what we see is that BMI is not a good proxy for health. It just gets us into trouble, whether we're looking at people who are in the normal weight category or people are in the categories of overweight or obese. So for all of these reasons, it just does not seem to be helpful for us to use this when we're trying to help people in terms of health. There is no evidence that body mass index is really a very good diagnostic tool. Um, instead, it just pathologizes certain bodies. And think about the terms that we use. We use the term overweight, implying that someone's overweight that's unhealthy for them. But yet we saw from the data that there are plenty of people who are in that category called overweight, yet are le leading disease-free lives. There's no there's there's no imperative for us to tell them that they're sick and there's something wrong with them. And likewise, there are many people in the obese category that live disease-free lives um, and, again, get misdiagnosed. And we find that it's not just BMI that's flawed in this way, but all of the weight and adiposity-based measures are similarly flawed. That if we want to consider health, there are a lot more ways, better ways that we can just look at health directly rather than wait.
And I know the next question that always comes at me is, well, okay, if, if fatter people are living at least as long as people in the normal weight category, what about disease? I mean, we hear so much about things like cardiovascular disease and type 2 di diabetes, and that they're much more common among heavier people. So how do you explain this? Well, it certainly is true that, that there are many diseases that we can see that are more common among larger people. But yet, when we look at the data, what we find is that there are a lot of confounding fi um, factors that confuse the picture. And that's because a lot of the data is drawn from epidemiologic studies. Now, epidemiologic studies are basically just the studies that look at people over time and see what happens. So basically, it's showing that over time, there are more people that get type 2 diabetes that are heavier than, the, than people are that are thinner. But yet, what we also know when we look at the data is that there are a lot of things that heavier people are more likely to have in common that have nothing to do with their weight. So for example, heavier people are more likely to diet. And we know that dieting can actually cause quite a bit of health problems. It can cause more inflammation, for example, in the bloodstream, which may lead to type 2 diabetes. Um, let me give you an example of some of the confounders that we found with weight. Probably one of the biggest confounders has to do with fitness levels. And if you take a look at this chart, it came from an article that was published in JAMA. What we see is if you look at the orange box, that's referring to people that are fit. And what we see is that it doesn't matter whether you're normal weight, overweight, or obese. If you're fit, you have pretty good longevity. On the other hand, um, if you're unfit, that seems to be when people run into health problems. And what, what this data is showing is that if you're obese but yet exercising regularly, you have much better health than someone who's normal weight and not. So it really seems like a big issue that could be helpful for us is to target fitness levels as opposed to weight. Here's another example, socioeconomic status. When you think about something like type 2 diabetes, what we find when we examine the data is that poverty is much, much more strongly associated with type 2 diabetes than weight. So this makes a statement that we would do much better by addressing social inequity than we would by addressing weight. Another issue that comes up is that we can see that when people have insulin resistance, which is one of the markers um, for type 2 diabetes, it causes their body to preferentially store fat. So what we see is that the disease actually causes people to gain weight. So it may be that we're looking at it backwards, that the bigger issue about why people are who have type 2 diabetes are more likely to be heavier is because that the disease itself causes weight gain. Now, I don't want to imply that weight plays no role in, type two, in causing type 2 diabetes. It may. But what I am suggesting is that it is very much blown out of proportion. And for all of the diseases that we blame on obesity, there are much better ways of addressing the problem um, than addressing it through weight. What we know is that weight stigma carries much larger health risk than weight itself. It can't be good for people if we're telling them that um, their weight is causing them to get sick. It will. It's what we call the nocebo effect. Um, what's much better is if you support people in just enjoying their bodies and taking good care of them. That's going to inspire them to make better choices that are going to result in better health care. I know there's a lot of ideas out there that if people just do things right, that if they just eat well, if they exercise regularly, they should be able to lose weight and keep it off. And despite the fact that that is so commonly believed, it's told to us on an almost daily basis by healthcare practitioners, we don't have any data to show that that's true. The few times that we have looked at long-term studies, what we find is that there's eventual weight regain for the vast majority of people. And this is something that has actually been well studied. That yes, it's true. There are some individuals that manage to lose weight and keep it off. But they are very much in the minority. We just don't have the evidence that's showing that all of these ideas that we've assumed to be true for so long are working. Now, when we start to examine this in laboratories, there's a lot of reasons for us to understand why exercise and diet 
are not going to be effective for weight loss. What we know is that your body is very invested in what you weigh and that it's got a very strong regulatory system that tries to maintain you at the weight that you're at and tries to resist weight loss. So we can actually see that when people go on diets, for example, and they restrict your cal their calories, that it inspires the release of certain hormones, for example, that kick up their appetite so they want to eat more, that also um, slow down their metabolism so that they burn less energy and make up for the fact that they're taking in less energy. So in other words, your body can compensate for all of the behaviors that you're doing to try to lose weight. What we see is that this compensation is something that happens over a long term on a very slow basis. So you can be pretty good at fighting your body short term and losing weight, but gradually your body's going to fight back and over the course of a few years it might um, slow down your metabolism, for example, so that the same habits that used to result in weight loss may actually now result in you gaining weight because your body's just spending less energy. So we know that your body is very invested in helping you to maintain weight. And when people regain the weight after, um, after they've lost it, it's not their fault. It, that for many people, it's about just your body doing a very effective job of maintaining your weight. For all of these reasons, it's time for us to change the paradigm. Let's end this war on obesity and start a new peace movement. And in fact, that peace movement is gaining power. It's called the Health at Every Size movement. And all it asks us to do is to shift the focus away from weight and onto health. We can still encourage people to take on great health habits like exercising regularly and eating well. But let's do it for the sake of health and enjoying and taking good care of their bodies as opposed to looking at weight as something that's problematic and wrong. So the big premise behind Health at Every Size is to be weight neutral, to just support people in adopting good habits for good health as opposed to weight control. Um, and we can encourage lifestyle habits. So we can encourage people by to, for example, eat well, to pay attention to what their body's asking for, to eat when they're hungry, stop when they're full, for example, and allow their body to do its job of regulating their weight as opposed to trying to control and fight what their body's trying to do. We can encourage people to take joy in moving their bodies, as opposed to thinking of exercise as something that's punishment or something they need to do for weight control. Um, we can encourage people to look for things like meaningful work and supportive relationships, better management of stress. All of these are going to be valuable in people taking good care of their body, much more valuable than encouraging them to try to lose weight. And it's also important that we recognize that this is not just in a movement for individuals, but that we also have to address it on a wider institutional scale. We have to end our weight-based discrimination, for example, so that people can feel more comfortable living in the bodies that they have without the fear of um, losing their job, for example, that they're too heavy, or the social discrimination that comes from these body image standards that just don't take into consideration the beauty that can happen across the spectrum of weight. So I want to encourage everyone to rethink your ideas about weight. A lot of the notions that we hold about weight are prejudice. They're not based on good science or concern about people's welfare. And it's time for us to end our obsession about food and weight and to open up to the fact that our bodies can be a source of joy and we can nourish them well.